for IDCTA for doing our veterinarian Zoom series. Um, so tonight we're talking about gastric ulcers with your horses. And um, joining us tonight is Dr. Emily Weathern and Dr. David Heinze um, with Fox Valley Equine Practice. So Dr. Emily Weathered is a 2020 graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Veterinary Service um, and is completing a one-year internship at um, Fox Valley Equine Practice. She is particularly interested in dentistry, lameness, and gastroscopy. And Dr. David Heinze has been in private practice since graduating from the Purdue University School of Veterinary Medicine he started uh, Fox Valley Equine Practice soon after moving to Illinois in 1987. And Dr. Heinze enjoys all aspects of equine medicine with special interest in lameness, chiropractic, and dental issues. Um, so I just want to remind everyone just really quick that uh, to please mute yourself as well as to take yourself off your screen. Um, and we also have a chat for any sort of questions that we can answer at the end. Okay, you guys are up. Okay, thanks everyone for joining. I'm Dr. Emily Weathered um, and Dr. Heinze is here too. He may jump in, um, especially at the end if there's some questions. So um, the title of the presentation is Gastric Ulcers in Horses, Are You Up to Date? And um, we will have two little prize giveaways. One's kind of in the middle of the presentation and one's at the end. So make sure to stick around for those. So here's an outline of what we'll talk about today. We'll start with going over the normal um, gastric anatomy of the horse, make sure everyone's on the same page um, because the type of the two types of ulcers we'll talk about today are really sort of anatomy kind of dependent. So we'll, we'll go over that. And then we'll start talking about squamous ulcer disease. Um, those are typically what people think of when they say, their horse has gastric ulcers. We've known about this kind for a long time. We'll go over the cause, risk factors, um, and then how you classify them is really important, not only for, um, for record keeping, um, but just to keep things straight. And then um, clinical signs, how you diagnose them, and then treatment. And then after that, we'll move on to the second type of ulcers um, that we commonly see in horses, which are glandular ulcers. And we'll go over some of um, the similar things in that regard, and then prevention at the end, which we'll talk about prevention of both of them at the very end. Um, and then we'll, if you have questions during the presentation, you can go ahead and type them in the chat bar. Um, and then Lydia may kind of stop me if it's if we're kind of right talking about that topic. Otherwise, we'll try to answer them all at the end. So starting with anatomy, um, I included a diagram of the horse here. So um, you can see the stomach there. It's actually very small relative to the, the horse's large body size. Um, and you can see the esophagus coming down into the stomach. Um, the actual stomach size, the capacity is very small. So about two to four gallons. Um, and the reason that that is, is horses developed as, or they evolved as grazers. So they're meant to be eating sort of continuously all day long. So they don't need a large storage compartment um, when food can sort of continuously come in and go out. So they have quite a small stomach. Um, and then there's actually little digestion that happens in the stomach. It's more um, the act of like physically mixing the food and then a little bit of storage, um, but um, actually very little digestion. They have a huge hind gut um, and a lot of small intestine and the majority of the digestion and absorption happens later down, um, later down the GI tract. And then I just included the pH of the stomach. You can see it, it has a big range. Um, so it's more acidic or a lower pH at like the bottom of the stomach, which if I, if I say the bottom of the stomach, I'm referencing where that stomach starts to enter into the small intestine. And then it's more basic or a higher pH um, at the, the top or where the esophagus is coming into the stomach. So now let's look inside of the stomach. So um, there's two main different tissue types in the stomach, squamous mucosa, which is labeled there. Um, it's the light pink mucosa. It's kind of at the top of the stomach. And then 
glandular mucosa and they're, they're very different. They have different purposes. Um, the glandular mucosa is at the bottom um, and it surrounds where the small intestine, um, where the stomach and the small intestine meet. And then I often get asked on when I'm gastroscoping a horse if those two different tissue types are, is that normal? So yes, they should look drastically different and there should be that sharp line dividing them. And that sharp line actually has a name, it's called the Margo Placatus. So um, I may reference that in the next few slides just for orientation um, because ulcers kind of like to form around that certain area. So another um, anatomical landmark I'll mention quite a bit later on is the pylorus. And you can see that's labeled there. You can think of the pylorus as the end of the, the bottom of the stomach. So it's right where the small intestine starts. And there's a sphincter there, and that's a place that commonly forms ulcers. And we really make a point when we're gastroscoping a horse to look at that spot. Um, so, and then the small intestine, it's pointing the duodenum, that's the start of the small intestine there. So the picture on the right is actually a still image taken from a gastroscopy. You can see the squamous mucosa, and this is normal. You can see the squamous mucosa at the top. It's really light, um, whitish yellow. Then that sharp distinction is the margo placatus. And then the, the darker pink at the bottom is the glandular mucosa. So these two different areas um, are very different histologically. So the squamous mucosa, you can think of as it being very, very similar to a, the mucosa that lines the esophagus. So a continuation of the esophagus. The actual cell type is called stratified squamous. Um, and then there are no glands in the squamous mucosa. So there are, it's not, its purpose is not to secrete things. Um, the squamous mucosa is not supposed to be in contact with acid. Acid or gastric juices and acid, gastric acid is secreted at the bottom of the stomach. So it, that acid should not be getting up in the squamous mucosa. So it doesn't have um, intrinsic protective me mechanisms um, because it doesn't really need them. And then um, glandular mucosa or that dark pink tissue at the very bottom um, has glands. So those glands secrete a few different things, but hydrochloric acid. So um, that has a, the biggest effect on why the, the stomach's pH is what it is. And then pepsin, which breaks down proteins, bicarbonate, which is a base and, um, and buffers, or you can think of that as counteracting the acid um, and then mucus. So um, this, because acid is secreted normally in the bottom of the stomach and is in contact with the glandular mucosa, the glandular mucosa has intrinsic protective mechanisms to protect itself. Um, and so it shouldn't be um, disrupted or inflamed by the acid. So it has a, a really good mucus layer and it has very good blood flow in that area of the stomach. And then it produces bicarbonate to buffer the, the gastric acid. So equine gastric ulcer syndrome is an umbrella term, and it really can be broken down into these two different types of ulcers. So on the left, we have squamous ulcer disease. That, those are ulcers in the squamous mucosa. Um, you can see them, they're right above that margo placatus. They really like to form there. And then glandular ulcer disease is in the glandular mucosa at the bottom of the stomach, and they really like to form around the pylorus. So you can see that's the pylorus in the picture on the right. That dark circle in the middle is actually the small intestine is right through there. And then um, that is a glandular ulcer at about five o'clock in this picture. So we will start with talking about squamous ulcer disease. So just to get everyone on the same page, here's the diagram. In the middle is what normal should look like. And then on the right is abnormal. So you can see there is an ulcer in the squamous mucosa just above the margo placatus there. Um, here is a video of a gastroscopy I did. And this is a, um, this was a normal, I didn't see any ulcers in this particular case or view, but what we're doing here is you can see water coming in is we're trying to rinse off all those foam and bubbles and food um, because ulcers can sometimes be hiding under there. And sometimes 
that material actually likes to stick on top of the ulcer. So you really try to rinse it off well. Um, and we do look 360 degrees around the Margo Placatus. So that video was just one spot, but um, we will sort of advance the scope and back up the scope and look everywhere. And we will also look up higher. So we'll look at, at the top of the stomach too and make sure there's no rogue ulcers somewhere else. And then here is a video from a gastroscopy of a horse who does have squamous ulcers. So um, you can see there's some smaller red ones. And then here's one that's actually quite a bit bigger and it was bleeding a little bit. Um, and they're, the horse is sedated during this, but, but they're standing and their stomach does um, contract. So it can kind of push the scope around. That's why it's a little bit, um, a little bit shaky but we're just getting a really good look all the way around. There's all that gastric acid and juice at the bottom where it should be. And then we'll go ahead and rinse all this foam off. And as you can see, there was a larger ulcer hiding under that foam there. So um, I think the video goes on a bit more, but that's the gist of that. So we know why squamous ulcers form. Um, it's due to exposure to the hydrochloric acid, which in this picture, you can see all that gastric juice with the hydrochloric acid at the bottom of the stomach where it should be. It shouldn't be in contact with the squamous mucosa for long periods of time. And so when it is, the squamous mucosa has no intrinsic protective mechanisms to protect itself and it can develop ulcers. Um, and then the severity of the ulcers is really related to how long it's exposed to the gastric acid. So the longer it is, or the hydrochloric acid, the longer it is, the worse the ulcers. So um, we definitely know it's a problem with, with acid. So risk factors. Um, a big one is fasting or horses that aren't fed um, or, or have long periods of time between being fed. So you can think of about six hours. Anything over six hours is definitely putting them more at risk of developing ulcers. Um, and that is because the stomach constantly secretes hydrochloric acid, regardless of if a horse is eating or not. Um, it does secrete more when a horse eats, but if a horse is fasted and not eating at all, it still is secreting it. Um, and when, when a horse eats, they produce a, a lot of saliva, and saliva has bicarbonate in it, which buffers acid. So if horses aren't eating, they're pr not producing much saliva, and they're not buffering that acid that the stomach is constantly producing. Um, and, and hay and alfalfa in itself also um, acts to buffer acid a little bit. So um, horses that are fasted are, are at are definitely at an increased risk. And then another um, very well-known risk factor is performance horses, particularly race horses. Um, some studies have found that up to 90% of race horses have gastric ulcers. Um, so kind of two, two reasons why when a horse is exercising, there is delayed gastric emptying. Um, but just the actual act of exercising creates pressure changes in the abdomen. And you can think of it as sloshing that gastric, the gastric juices and gastric acid up on the squamous mucosa when they're exercising. And then um, another risk factor is a high carbohydrate diet. So those are the diets that have a lot of grain in them. Um, senior feeds are, are much less risky, but horses that are on sweet feeds um, are definitely more at risk because um, a fermentation byproduct of grains are volatile fatty acids. And when acidity in the stomach increases a little bit, those volatile fatty acids are able to um, penetrate the squamous mucosa. And that results in, in cell inflammation and damage and ulceration. So those high carbohydrate diets definitely increase risk. And some further risk factors, um, stress, I think everyone knows, can predispose to ulcers. Stress is really, really horse dependent. So um, some horses are very stressed at horse shows and maybe at more risk, while other horses love horse shows um, and it doesn't actually cause that much physiologic stress and changes in their body. Um, but definitely trailering, isolation, horses that are in stall rest, and then even things that are more subtle, like a horse who's with a larger group of horses and they just don't seem 
to, to be a good fit together that can kind of cause a low grade chronic stress. Um, and then lastly, another big risk factor is chronic non-steroidal anti-inflammatory um, administration. So people typically think of those as bute and banamine. Um, those NSAID, NSAIDs decrease um, prostaglandin in the stomach and they can disrupt blood flow. And the prostaglandin is protective, a protective mucosal factor in the stomach. So if you decrease prostaglandin, you're more at risk of ulcer formation. Um, and if you don't have as good blood flow, there's difficulty with healing. Um, for horses that get a dose of banamine here or there for colic, or if they um, have a little swelling from some, whatever going on and you give them banamine for a few days or bute for a few days, that's very low risk. Um, I'm really talking about the horses that are on long-term bute or very, very high doses that are more at risk. But as always, you should try to minimize um, the amount of banamine and bute you can as necessary. So now we'll go over the grading system for ulcers. So for squamous ulcers, they're graded on a scale of zero to four and zero is normal. So this is an example of a grade one squamous, a few grades, grade one squamous ulcers, but they're hyperemic. Um, the, the mucosa is, if it's ulcerated, it's very minimally ulcerated. Um, it, it doesn't even have to be like an actual defect ulceration, but it could be just an area of hyperemia or redness. Um, and so comparing this to a grade two, now the mucosa is actually, there's, there is a, a a defect in it. Um, there is depth to the ulcer. And you can see here, they're a bit, a little bit larger. They're red. Um, and comparing a grade two to a grade three, the difference really is size. So not number. So for example, this horse has a, a lot of grade two ulcers and here just a few grade three. But if you can see this grade three ulcer is large in, in diameter um, and it's a bit red, I would say it's a little bit hemorrhagic or bleeding. Um, and then the, the one on the right looks a bit more chronic to me. Um, the, the mucosa is thickened and you can see it's yellow tinged. Um, sometimes that yellow color discoloration is due to bile because um, it's secreted at the start of the small intestine and can kind of just go back up in the stomach a little bit. Um, but in this case, um, yellow can also be fibrin, which is um, involved in the healing process, in the inflammation process. And I think that that's a little bit of, of fibrin around these ulcers here and um, just thickened more chronic, um, sign, more chronic changes that signify. I think these ulcers on the right have been there for a while. And then lastly, this is a grade four ulcer. We're kind of looking at it from the side, but these are areas of deep ulceration. And you can see how, just how thickened that squamous mucosa is. And um, there's, there's an ulcer deep, sort of deep between those folds. Um, and so again, if you noticed, a lot of these ulcers like to form right above the margo placatus in that particular area. So that's why we take such a good look at that area. So moving on to clinical signs of squamous ulcers, they can be subclinical. So you may, your horse may show no signs that tell you that they have ulcers going on. Two of the most common complaints we get are, one is definitely behavior. A lot of people will say their horse is pinning, pinning his ears when they're um, currying him, especially along the flanks or where the girth goes and he never used to do that. Um, or behavior changes under saddle. So a lot of people will say they feel like they can't get their horse out in front of their leg or they can't get their horse collected. So it's not always something dramatic like the horse is bucking or rearing. I would say in most cases, it's not dramatic like that. It's, it's pretty subtle things. Like they're just not quite performing like they used to. Um, sometimes they'll be, resist, they'll be reactive to a certain side of your, so your left leg. When you put your left leg on, they seem to switch their tail and not like that. Um, and then another common complaint is recurrent colic. So a horse that just gets colicky every now and then and banamine can help them kind of get them out of it, but then they'll get colicky again. They're never, an impaction's never found, a twist isn't found. It's just, they're not sure why they keep having those bouts. Um, 
And then other things such as a poor hair coat in more chronic cases, decreased appetite from just feeling crummy, weight loss in more chronic, in more chronic cases, and then teeth grinding every so often. So diagnosis, um, there is no blood test. There's no simple test to test for ulcers. Um, really the way to tell if a horse has ulcers is with gastroscopy, which fortunately can be done on the farm. Um, it's, it involves a little bit of setup, 10 or 15 minutes of setup and some sedation, um, but it can be all said and done in, in about an hour and the horse can go about the rest of their day completely fine. They could be ridden later that afternoon, um, but really seeing them with a camera and with your own eyes is the only way to diagnose ulcers. Um, so this is basically the gastroscope that we have. It's three meters long. It's connected to a laptop and then we have a live street or live video of everything we're doing and we can take screenshots as well to have still images. Um, and this, this um, gastroscope is, there's those dials you can see right above the guy's hand. Um, and those dials are able to manipulate the very end with the camera. So the camera's on the very tip of that gastroscope and those dials allow the end of the gastroscope to basically go in any which way for 360 degrees. So it's very, um, it's very sensitive with the dials. Um, so we perform gastroscopy to diagnose ulcers, and then it's very important to repeat a gastroscopy after treatment. So typically we treat for a month and then recommend repeat doing another gastroscopy to make sure that they have, are resolved before discontinuing treatment or if they're healing but not resolved, then we may need to continue treatment and rescope a, a third time. So preparation is a huge part of this. Horses have to be fasted. You don't want food in their stomach because food can, um, it inhibits our view. So you won't, if you don't fast your horse, scoping may be near impossible, or it will prevent us from potentially getting to the bottom of the stomach. So um, basic horse owners will typically remove food the night before. Um, we tell them about 14 hours and then we schedule the scope for early in the next morning. So they're mostly sleeping anyways, they, they don't mind it too much. I think it's harder sometimes for the owners. Um, some horses will try to eat the bedding, so they'll eat the straw or the shavings, which we would see in the gastroscope. So if, they're, if you think they'll do that, just put a muzzle on them overnight. Um, put a do not feed sign on the stall because you don't want someone to accidentally throw them a flake of hay and not know it. And then pull water four hours before the gastroscope. So that morning, um, a stomach can empty liquid very quickly, 15 to 30 minutes. So four hours is plenty of time. Um, but we still try to give us a wide margin there. And then the procedure itself, we typically just do this in like a wash rack or in a stall at the farm. We can do it year round unless it's very, very cold. If it's very cold, like below freezing, the gastroscope can, um, the, there's a lot of cables in there that can be affected. So in that case, we'll either need some sort of lights that are heating the stall, the wash rack, or um, we work often with a referral hospital down the road um, that we work together really well. And sometimes people will haul in there and then we'll just go there and do the gastroscope there. So we give IV sedation, um, Sedivet, they're both alpha twos, um, and then xylazine are pretty standard for what I use. Um, and they're really no more sedated than they would be for a dental. Um, and uh, they recover fairly quickly. Usually by the time we're finishing up the scope, they're already waking up and they can go back to eating shortly after. So when we're ready, when the horse is sedated, we'll put the scope up very sim in the exact same way as if your horse is being tubed for colic in the nostril, pass it through the nasal passages to the larynx, then we'll have them swallow it into the esophagus and then um, go down into the stomach. And we'll put a, just a little bit of air in the stomach to expand it, which drops that water line or the gastric liquid line down. So we just get a better view of the tissue. Um, first, we go all the way to the bottom. So we look at the pylorus and the glandular mucosa right away. And then we back up and look at the squamous mucosa. And then when we're done there, we'll, we'll remove suction out any excess air just so they don't feel crampy, although it's um, 
fairly uncommon for them to colic from that, from air that's put in from a gastroscope, but we remove it nonetheless, and then we remove the scope. Um, so here's an image just showing you just how long we need that scope to be to get down there. So it has to travel up through their nose, down their neck, and then into the stomach. Um, and we actually do kind of curl it around itself like that. And the way that we do that is we use the, the walls of the stomach itself like a crutch. So we advance the scope along the wall. So it gives the scope some stability from not just falling down. And then as the stomach curves, the scope curves and we can actually look completely back around and see the scope coming into the stomach through the esophagus, which is actually a really cool um, view to see. And here is just a very short video of us passing the scope. Um, so we're just getting ready. Now we're in the nasal passages. We're traveling up through the nasal passages. The scope is, we have lidocaine gel on the scope and lubrication. So um, it slides through their nose very easy. Um, up top is normal nasal anatomy, but the, the um, larynx is down here. So we're just orienting the scope this way. This is the trachea is straight through that big hole. We're trying to get him to swallow, he just coughed. And this horse had tie back surgery. So if you notice his arytenoid on the right there is a bit strange, but um, we'll try one more time. We got it to the side and now he's swallowed it. And now we're in the esophagus. Um, he had quite a bit of bubbles, but you'll get just a little bit clearer view in a second of what the esophagus looks like. So there we are. It's has peristalsis in it, and so it's kind of contracting on the scope, but we'll just blow air in to open it up and pass it right down into the stomach within a matter of a few seconds, and we'll be down there. So if we diagnose a horse with gastric, with squamous ulcers, um, the mainstay of treatment is uh, proton pump inhibitors. So proton pumps are, within the cell membrane of the cells that make up the squamous or that make up the glandular um, mucosa. So um, parietal cells or protons or hydrochloric acid is secreted into the lumen. And because we know that gastric acid play, is, is the reason for the development of squamous ulcers, we want to decrease hydrochloric acid in the stomach. So we do that with a drug called omeprazole, commonly known as gastroguard or ulcerguard. And GastroGuard is FDA approved for the treatment of um, squamous ulcers in horses at a dose of four mg per kg or one full tube for a full size horse. It's given orally once a day for 28 days. Um, it's given just like you would a dewormer. You just put it in their mouth. Um, and then I thought I'd include in here UlcerGuard. UlcerGuard is the exact same medication as GastroGuard. It's the same concentration. It's just FDA approved for prevention. So if you notice the dose here is one mg per kg once a day, which is a quarter of the previous dose. So if you're taking a horse who is prone to developing ulcers, has been treated, has been rescoped, his ulcers are gone, but you're taking him to a horse show and you're worried, he might be very stressed and develop ulcers again you could put him on a preventative dose, which is a quarter of the full dose. So um, UlcerGuard is available over the counter. Some people like to price shop. If they can find UlcerGuard cheaper than GastroGuard, you could use UlcerGuard for the full treatment for squamous ulcers. You would just give the entire tube um, in the exact same way you would GastroGuard. So as far as how the treatment program, um, GastroGuard is most, that the efficacy is the best if given on an empty stomach. So you fast them for 30 minutes in the morning, you give them the full tube of GastroGuard. Um, you make sure that you give it time to absorb and be decreasing acid secretion by the time that you feed them. So you give them 30 minutes and then you feed them. Okay, so now is time for the first giveaway. So for this giveaway, we will send the person that either if whoever gets the right answer or whoever gets the right answer first, we will just have you send your email address and we'll mail you a tube of GastroGuard, which you could use as um, 
there would be a few doses in there if you used it in a preventative manner for something like a horse show. So the next slide will be a short video of a gastroscopy and there will be something strange in the video and we'll see if anyone can identify what we're looking at. That's the video. If anyone has any guesses, you can just type them in the little comment bar. Um, if someone chat at the bottom, yep, I got my eyes on it. <laughs> and you don't have to know technical names. If you kind of have an idea, just make up a best guess and we'll go with it. Don't have anything so far. We may have to give hints. Okay. So if you saw it moved. <laughs> that was gonna be my hint. <laughs> oh. Okay, well, hmm, the first answer is, is it a worm? Is that our only answer? Yes. Okay, then that, I say they get it. So, I say they get it, yep. yeah. We'll go with that. It's a larva, so it's a bot larva. Um, so if you've ever seen those little white, yellow <laughs> things on your horse's cannon bones in the summer, those bot, bot eggs, Horses can groom themselves, swallow the eggs, and then these larvae develop in their stomach and throughout their circle of life eventually will be passed and develop into bot flies or actual flies. Um, but here's a still picture of a horse with quite a few larvae in their stomach. Um, they, we, we occasionally see this, however, um, deworming schedules that people use typically treat for these and, and take care of them. Um, they're almost like 99% of the time not pathologic. They don't cause the horse any discomfort or pain or clinical signs. If I do see them, I'll recommend giving an ivermectin containing dewormer, um, but they're just kind of an interesting incidental finding that we see sometimes. So, now we'll move on to glandular ulcer disease. So we're talking about um, ulcers, a completely different type of ulcer that forms at the bottom of the stomach. So now we're talking about that dark red tissue in the um, picture on the left, where it's going uh, that entire area, but also the, specifically the pylorus. So the middle picture is the pylorus. So where the small intestine is, is starting, that's a healthy looking pylorus in the middle and the one on the right has ulcers. So you can see one on the bottom kind of at six o'clock and then one more at four o'clock. So here's just a short video of an, a relatively normal looking pylorus. So there's peristalsis and contractions happening right now. That's why it's moving. Um, but we really get a good look all around this area. Sometimes their stomach will actually push the scope into the small intestine, which is fine. You can look in there a little bit as well too. We don't typically with every scope, but you can. Um, and then here is a short video of the horse with the ulcers. So you can see there's one that's a bit raised on the bottom. And then on the right, there's more of a reddened ulcer. And these are called glandular ulcers. And we will back up so we try to get to where we wanna go right away and then I'll slowly back up and I'll make sure I look further back and that make sure we're not missing an ulcer further back here. So the exact cause or kind of pathophysiology of why glandular ulcers develop is not completely understood because like I said earlier, the glandular mucosa has intrinsic protective mechanisms to protect itself from acids. So ulcers should not form in the glandular mucosa, but we're finding that they do, um, and it's not uncommon for them to. So we think that there's some breakdown of their normal protective mechanisms. So there's a disruption to the blood flow down there. They have a decrease in the mucus secretion, which is protective to the mucosa, or there's a decrease in the bicarbonate secretion. Um, overall, his, they've looked at these things histologically, and they're finding that there's just some, there's, there's a major inflammatory process that's going on. Um, but that's unfortunately sort of the extent that is understood about why they occur. 
So risk factors, warm bloods are definitely overrepresented for glandular ulcers. They're more common in that breed. And then um, similar to squamous ulcers, performance horses are, are more predisposed. And then stress is also a risk factor, um, as well as um, you can get them from overuse of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories as well. So we don't grade glandular ulcers like we do squamous ulcers. Instead, we use a ton of adjectives. So typically I'll try to pick an adjective from each of those four groups. So is the, are the ulcers mild, moderate, or severe? Focal are just one little area. Multifocal, are there a lot of ulcers? Or diffuse, are they kind of everywhere? Um, flat, are they raised or depressed? And then hemorrhagic, or are they bleeding? Fibrinoseparative, is there fibrin on top of them or pus or hyperemic, which is just reddened. So we'll go through just a few examples of how we would classify these things. I would call these ulcers definitely mild, very mild. Multifocal, there's a few of them. They're, they're flat um, and then they're hyperemic or reddened. Here's a larger ulcer. I would call it moderate focal because it's really just that one area. It's definitely raised, um, hemorrhagic, you can't quite tell in this picture, but um, as the, the stomach contracted, it did bleed a little bit. And then this one I would call moderate, multifocal, raised, um, and fibrinoseparative. So the pylorus or the small intestine is just right around and to the left in this picture. So we're kind of looking at it from the side, but you can see these ulcers have that kind of yellowish look on top of them. And that's, um, that's where I'm getting the term fibrinoseparative from. So kind of fibrin and pus. Um, and then this is one that I would call moderate, focal, flat, and again, fibrinoseparative. I think this is the last example. This was a really interesting one. Um, the ulcers looked like bike spokes at this pylorus. So they sort of radiated out. Um, so I would call it moderate, multifocal, flat, fibrinoseparative. And as much as I tried to rinse off that, I couldn't get that to rinse off. So that truly was um, fibrin. And when I rescoped that horse a, a month later, um, all that fibrin was gone, but there were hyperemic ulcers. So that same bike spoke pattern was there, but it was sort of pink, bright pink lines that were radiating out. So it, it was healing, it just needed more time and more treatment. So clinical signs, if you notice, this is the exact same slide as I used for squamous ulcers. So a lot of the same clinical signs and you can't differentiate if a horse has squamous or glandular ulcers based on clinical signs. Clinical signs can hint or cue to you that your horse might have ulcers, but they don't tell you what kind. So we can see all the same things for glandular ulcers. And then moving on to treatment. So we'll talk about two main treatment options we use for glandular ulcers. The, um, the first is the combination of GastroGuard and sucralfate. So GastroGuard alone will not treat glandular ulcers. You have to add in the sucralfate. Sucralfate is a gastric protectant. Um, it binds really well to irritated um, and ulcerated tissue and, and acts like a physical band-aid over the ulcers. And it also has some properties that stimulate bicarbon mucus secretion and it helps buffer acid. And then GastroGuard we talked about before. So if you just use GastroGuard, it may improve the ulcers a little bit, but not not, it won't get you where you need to be. You really have to add in the sucralfate. Um, so the treatment protocol is a bit, it's just time intensive. It's nothing difficult. It just takes patience. So you, in the morning, fast them for 30 minutes, give the tube of GastroGuard like we talked about before, and then wait an hour and give six tablets of sucralfate orally. So that hour between the GastroGuard and sucralfate is really important. And then you want, you, and you also need to make sure to give the GastroGuard first. If you give the sucralfate first, it acts like a Band-Aid physical barrier and can, and can um, disrupt the absorption of the GastroGuard. So we give them in this order and then you wait 30 minutes and then you feed them normally for the rest of the day. And then in the evening, you're just giving the sucralfate. So the same sort of plan, wait, wait an hour, give the sucralfate, wait 30 minutes and feed. Um, 
And then the second medication is mesoprostol, which is, it's a prostaglandin agonist. I mentioned before prostaglandin is a normal chemical in the stomach that um, protects the mucosa of the stomach. So this drug um, acts like prostaglandin that they naturally produce, and it helps to stimulate mucus and bicarb secretion, increase mucosal blood flow, and then has some anti-inflammatory properties. So basically these, these two medication plans, you're trying to make up for whatever went wrong with the inherent intrinsic protective mechanisms the stomach, the glandular tissue should have had. Um, meso, so I should have mentioned before, sucralfate and um, gastrogard will treat glandular ulcers, but they will also treat squamous ulcers. So if a horse unfortunately has both types, we would use this treatment plan because it would treat both. Mesoprostol will only treat glandular ulcers. So if a horse has both types, mesoprostol would not be my, my choice in medication. Um, and um, mesoprostol is in, in humans actually can cause uterine, well in horses too, but it can cause uterine contractions and abortion. So pregnant women should not handle this medication and pregnant horses should not receive this medication. Um, and for all these treatment programs, we recommend treating for a month, so 28 to 30 days, and then rescoping to assess progress before stopping any medications. Um, and before moving on, I get a question frequently that I, I think my horse has ulcers. Why don't I just treat them for a month and see if the signs go away without scoping them? You can do that. However, now that we've talked about the two different types, um, it's not so easy to choose the medication. So if you just start GastroGuard and give, which is a, a fairly big financial commitment and give GastroGuard for an entire month, but your horse had glandular ulcers, you're probably not gonna heal them completely. So you can treat, but you're not quite sure what medication to use. And you don't know if they've completely healed in a month and you could stop treatment and they haven't and they could progress again. So, um, just finishing up with the mesoprostol, quite a bit easier um, as far as time. So it's 11 tablets in the morning and 11 at night. You can give it with feed. Um, so in a horse that just has glandular ulcers, it's definitely worth a discussion with the owner about mesoprostol versus gastrogard and sucralfate. Both are similar in their efficacy. Um, there are some reasons I go with one over the other. So it's worth a discussion. Um, and then moving on to prevention. So minimize stress, not only when you're treating a horse for ulcers, but if you just, just the best treatment is prevention for ulcers. So any horse minimize stress. Horses love turnout. So regular turnout's great for them. Make sure they're with horses that get along. Like we talked about, fasting isn't great. So uh, using a hay nut or a slow hay feeder so they can eat more frequently as opposed to a big meal in the morning and a big meal at night. And then if they're on a high carbohydrate diet, see if you can make any changes there. Can you switch to something that has more fat in it, which is fat actually or oil um, is actually uh stomach friendly. So can you switch to maybe a senior feed instead? And then decrease exercise. Now, a lot of horses that I scope are performance horses. So it's just not realistic for them not to be working over the treatment period. Um, some horses love horse shows. And so that's actually probably not too much of an issue if horse shows stress them out. Um, it's just important that the owner knows it could slow, it could prolong the treatment um, program. And then as far as prevention in a horse who um, we're not treating for gastric ulcers, but we don't want them to develop any, you can give that quarter tube of GastroGuard or UlcerGuard a few days before the stressful event, um, and then every day during the stressful event, and then a few days after. And if it's a horse that's currently developing glandular ulcers, you might uh, want to add in sucralfate with that as well. Prevention continued. So these are these things here I typically recommend during treatment for ulcers as well. So for squamous ulcers, um, I recommend feeding alfalfa hay or cubes and just like a quarter flake of alfalfa hay 30 minutes before riding forms, literally forms a physical like mat on top of the um, 
gastric contents and that mat helps prevent sloshing of that gastric juice and liquid up onto the squamous mucosa while they're being exercised and worked. And then um, corn oil is really anti-inflammatory for the stomach. It um, helps increase their prostaglandin and you can use um, as little as an ounce once a day. Um, and then we have had a lot of luck with Purina Outlast and a lot of owners that are really, really um, liking this supplement. Um, I have the ingredients here, but what it really does is help, um, help with, with the pH in the stomach. Um, it's just a pelleted top dressing. So it's, I recommend one and a half cups, two to three times a day. Um, and some horses will be on this just preventatively for ulcers long-term. So they could be on this quite a while. Um, we've even used it for some things like horses that have normal manure, but is maybe a little bit liquidy at the very end. And um, Purina Outlast has helped improve that in some horses. So um, so these three things I definitely recommend when we're treating, when we're treating ulcers, but um, preventatively as well, if you, your horse was treated and healed, but you want to try to really prevent it from recurring, I would probably recommend keeping them on the outlast and then um, adding in the corn oil. So this is the last giveaway we have. It's a little slow feeder hay bag type thing. Um, it says ulcer guard on it. So this is just a trivia question, but does anybody know how much saliva, and we're talking in, we'll say in gallons, or you could put liters, but how much saliva can a horse produce in a day if they're fed a high forage diet? So if they're constantly eating grain, uh, hay all day or out grazing, um, best guess, and who's ever closest or gets it, will get this um, hay bag. Oh, let's see. Let me read this. Um, yeah. All right. So the person that, that won the tube of GastroGuard says three gallons. So where's my buzzer? <laughs> Next guest. Do you want to give a hint? Um, like higher, <laughs> higher or lower? Higher. Oh, Linda Roberts says 10 gallons. Ding, ding, ding. Yes, very good. So up to 10 gallons, um, horses have three paired salivary glands. And when they're eating, they can produce up to um, 50 milliliters a minute. So if you've ever had like those big syringes where you can crush up meds and syringe it with water, they're about that big, that's 60 milliliters. So it's quite a, it's quite a large amount. Um, so I just included that because um, we talked about how eating stimulates salivary production and helps buffer gastric acid. So it is important. So that is everything I have for you guys. Um, and we can use, it looks like we have about nine or 10 minutes left. Um, if anybody has any questions. My question is, is that your horse? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know someone had asked. Um, oh, I have a, que oh, I see a question. Go go it says, do you recommend a hind gut supplement during treatment? Um, I have not included anything like that in with my typical treatment programs for gastric ulcers, and I've had pretty good success. Um, hind gut ulcers are occur for a little bit for some different reasons. There's some overlap in, in sort of risk factors. Um, but as far as supplements, I don't include a supplement, a, like a, a specific hind gut supplement in with my, with my typical protocol. Not that I don't think it would, um, I just don't know that it would help too much. Well, and I interrupted you, what were you going to say before I asked? Oh, question? someone had sent in a question asking about EPM and gastric ulcers. Um, and I really dug deep into research and was not finding too much on the connection there. Um, um, EPM can have an, uh, cause some changes with some um, interleukin receptors, which are inflammatory receptors. So I could try to make a connection, but I, they asked if, if I was aware of any research that had been done, scientific research on the connection there. And I was just not finding anything on that. 
I have another question. Is hanging the tongue out another sign of ulcers? And this person says when they're under saddle, when they're being ridden. Hanging the tongue out. Um, no, I, well, I don't want to say no. Anything could be a sign of ulcers, but that's not a typical sign that I, that I see. Okay. I, if that was the case, I would be looking more potentially into dentition and their TMJ and how they're carrying their head and their neck and, and the bit would be the things I would look at first um, before going straight to potentially being ulcers. Next question is thoughts on a glandular ulcer that will not heal despite 90 days of treatment with everything you discussed. Yes. So sometimes with, so with ulcers in humans, um, helico, there's, there's sometimes an infectious agent involved. I think in humans, helicobacter pylori, mm -hmm. and you treat with antibiotics. It is not believed in horses that an infectious process is primarily involved in ulcers. However, sometimes they can become secondarily infected um, because that that those ulcers are disrupted unhealthy tissue and bacteria could take hold. So sometimes if we're having horses that we've scoped a few times and we just can't get the glandular ulcers to heal, we will put them on, um, and this isn't common, but doxycycline, which is an antibiotic, um, to see if they're potentially secondarily infected, which is inhibiting healing. So I would do the doxycycline in addition to um, the treatment protocol I talked about, but that's something that I would, that I would discuss um, can Equiox be given to a horse that is prone to ulcers? So Equiox is, was developed with, with, um, with it, the thought that it's easier in the stomach than giving something like Bute or Banamine every day. There is the risk with Equiox. It's definitely decreased. Um, but there, there is still the risk that it can have an effect on the gastric mucosa. Um, so I would prefer not to give Equiox if I'm treating that horse for ulcers. If that horse, if, if it's a matter of the horse can't be kept comfortable without Equiox and, and, you know, it doesn't have ulcers at the time, but we're worried about them occurring, you know, I think that it may be worth keeping the horse on the Equiox, but we would really look at management. So can we, how can we decrease stress in that horse's life? What supplements can we put them on? Can we put them on Purina Outlast? Can we get them eating hay all the time? And I think if we, if we combine those things along with the Equiox that we could probably, we could, we could prevent that horse from getting ulcers from the Equiox, definitely. And we've had horses on Equiox for quite a long time and do just fine. Uh, this one will be a fun one. There is controversy at our barn about the use of hay nets. Some say it's not a natural way for a horse to eat and is bad for them, even though it slows them down. Your thoughts? Um, I like that hay nets give them something to do um, and keep them eating for a while. The issue that I have with hay nets is if they're hung high, they're, mm -hmm. they can't drain their nasal secretions mm -hmm. and any junk they have in there, they can't drain very effectively. That's why horses that are tied in a trailer and shipped a long ways, right. not only from stress, but not being able to put their head down can be at risk to respiratory diseases. So um, that, that would be a thought of mine um, with the hay nut. So could you hang it lower? If you hang it too low, you worry they might get a foot through it. So I don't have a great answer for that. Uh, and I don't think there is a right answer of one way or the other. Um, that's all the questions that I have here, unless somebody else has another one. I, I, think, I think we're good. Okay, great. And then just send me those emails and we'll get those prizes sent out to those two people. Sounds great. All right. Thanks, everyone. They're saying this was informative and thank you. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. Thank Have you. a good night. Thank you.